Sorry, sorry for that. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, and analogously, we uh, generalized the previous statement to the following hypothesis. Uh, so, if we have a vibration of n types, vibration of n types. where the fiber is an n minus one type. So uh, an n type is just a space that does not have any homotopy groups above dimension m. Uh, so these vibrations are classified, uh, vibrations are classified Uh, by weak functors from V to n, uh, n minus one groupoids. So we had n equal to one and zero groupoids or just sets above. And so that's an immediate generalization. So operations classified. Okay, uh, so that was uh, one thing we did last time. We also talked about negative stuff. And that was the part where I tried to explain that uh, there is only one minus two category, which is just a point. And there is uh, two minus one categories. Uh, which is just a point and uh, an empty category. So uh, an analogous uh, situation holds for m uh, for m types. So minus two type is just a point that follows from the fact that it should have a contractible minus one homotopy group, and minus one type is either a point or an empty set. So here we sort of have this similarity that once again reinforces uh, this growth index dream idea. Okay. Then we talked about factorizations. So today I will continue to talk about factorizations. Sorry. And I will remind some basic facts about factorizations right now. So uh, let uh, P from E to B be an infinity functor, meaning that it just preserves uh, composition of morphisms up to higher morphisms. Uh, so E is essentially and subjective if uh, for any uh, and morphism and for any and morphism uh, which uh, just in B. Uh, we have a lift to the category E. So, uh, of course, uh, here the word essentially and our philosophy implies that uh, we actually do this up to equivalence. So, we do not necessarily have strict lift or uh, the word any means that uh, any up to equivalence. Okay, so let's consider an example, uh, which was already sort of done last time, but I will re repeat it anyways. So the simplest kind of categories are just sets 
and we can consider a point between such categories, which is just a map of sets. So it's a map of sets. And so uh, zero subjectivity or essential zero subjectivity, but I will drop the word essential from now on, uh, is the same as subjectivity on zero morphisms, aka objects. So this is equivalent to ordinary subjectivity. We also have one subjectivity, but since we're working with sets here, the only one morphisms in sets are just identities. So it's subjectivity on identities. And meaning just injectivity. So that is very nice. We obtained injectivity as subjectivity of certain kind. Uh, why I, well, I can explain why uh, one subjectivity uh, is equivalent to injectivity because if we had uh, an, an identity uh, f of a is equal to f of b, that means that we should have a lift and the lift will be necessarily a equals b. So that's just the condition of injectivity. And the best thing about uh, this simple example is that uh, we have a sort of trivial Kosnikov tower. We first uh, get a subjective morphism, then we get an injective morphism, we have a unique factorization. And um, it can be seen that uh, we factorize first by the morphism, which is uh, zero subjective, and then by the morphism, which is one subjective, or equivalently, we have a factorization by morphism, which is uh, not one subjective and not zero subjective. So this is this guy, this is this guy. Uh, what I'm saying now can sound very stupid because uh, this is a such a simple example, but later we will see that if we have, in fact, the Postnikov tower of length M, uh, this condition becomes meaningful. So uh, let me do it uh, in a slightly uh, more general context for categories instead of uh, sets. So we go one level higher, we have one morphisms now. So factorization for categories. We have a map, uh, well, a functor between categories and we decompose it like this. So here the functor is zero and one subjective not too subjective. Here the functor is zero or two subjective, not one subjective. And here we have a functor which is one two subjective. This a sort of suggests the general picture that we in fact should have a, a tower of the form E equal to E n, E n minus one, etc. E minus one, E minus two, and here we should have uh, not n subjective, not n minus one subjective, etc. So uh, we just. Uh, at each stage of this uh, Kosnikov tower, we just drop uh, one subjectivity condition and we obtain a sort of vibration with the fiber 
which has only one homotopy group. That's the basic philosophical idea behind all this. So uh, let me write it down. Functor. I mean, an infinity functor, of course. Uh, it gets purely J stuff. If P is isojective or I not equal J plus one. So uh, an example uh, functor gets one stuff if it forgets stuff. So uh, remember that we had uh, this tripartite uh, separation stuff properties structure. So for example, stuff for a group was a set, stuff for uh, properties for a group was, uh, so structure was the multiplication and properties were various properties of this multiplication, uh, i.e. it is unital, it has an inverse, uh, it is associative. So um, the functor which forgets one stuff forgets stuff. I mean that we forget, for example, the, the fact that the group was built from a set. Similarly, the factor forgets zero stuff. If it forgets structure. For example, we forget that uh, a set was endowed with multiplication. Uh, functor forgets minus one stuff if uh, it forgets properties minus two stuff if it forgets nothing. So, sort of the larger the larger the fiber is, uh, the more the more things we forget. So here we forget almost everything. We even, for example, if we forget uh, for a group the set from which it was built, we basically forget the group. Uh, and here, when the fiber is very small, it consists only of one point. We don't forget anything. So that's that's once again very trivial because, uh, you, of course, you know that. Uh, um, if we have a vibration with a trivial fiber, which consists of one point, it is an equivalent. But uh, it is somewhat uh, less trivial if I formulate it like this in categorical context. Okay. So uh, this all put together leads us to uh, the factorization. Hypothesis. I already stated it in some form. So we have um, an arbitrary infinity functor between n group words. And we want to say that it can be decomposed like this. Um, where PJ forgets purely J stuff. So if we think of it, okay, 
if we think topologically, we get the following picture. So, of course, the diagram remains the same. But the meaning of those maps is somewhat different. So the fiber PI is uh, Uh, is the foreign space. Uh, and so, yeah, that's the topological picture and it is very much reminiscent of the plastic tower, which uh, we know or we don't know, but there is a plastic tower for a map. Uh, especially if it is an N type, then it is a finite plastic. Uh, well, I'm sorry um, to speak absolutely uh, um, correctly, for if we decompose a map like this, it is not called a Posnikov tower, it is called Posnikov Moore tower. And if B is equal to a point, it is called Posnikov tower. And for N types, the Posnikov tower is finite. Okay, so now I will draw a silly picture. Uh, so we may think of studying. Uh, topological spaces like this. We have a cake which consists of uh, various homotopy groups. Uh, and we basically need to understand how to uh, classify all the layer cakes. That is why I wrote at the beginning of today's talk that uh, layer cake philosophy intensifies. So basically we have uh, a layer cake where each layer is just uh, fiber of Pn, fiber of Pn minus one, and so on, somewhere there, fiber of P0. And so um, we want to uh, classify all layer cakes. We do this. We have two tools. So the first one is uh, our Eilenberg McLean spaces. The second one are the glue or just key invariants. So key invariants are thingies that allow us to know how these uh, layers of cake are related to one another. And so that's basically uh, the study of topological spaces for you. Uh, but uh, in practice, of course, uh, this is not always realizable. Uh, but uh, let me explain how it, it, it should work in purely abstract terms. So I, I'm not saying that it works, but it should work theoretically. Okay, so we have a vibration, uh, EG to EG minus one, with the fiber that looks like this. So we want to reconstruct EG from EG minus one and some additional knowledge. So how can it be done? Well, uh, we can use Galois theory. And how it's going to work? Well, we will have, uh, so if we're given 
a vibration like this, we may try to construct a classifying map that goes like this. So it goes from the base space to automorphisms of the fiber. Mm. So how we should think of the functor K? Uh, Uh, let's first of all uh, think that B is an infinity category. Then one morphism in B lifts to a one morphism. In E, two morphism, two two morphism, and so on. And every lift actually gives us an automorphism of the fiber, because well, we we know that the lift should uh, that ends of this morphism should. Uh, project to the same point. So actually each lift gives an automorphism of the fiber. So we get this factor. Which is uh, which acts on so elements of B act on uh, F just by these lifts, and so that's basically the idea behind uh, non-abelian cohomology. So we may now say uh, it's sort of a definition, very sketchy one, but still a definition. Uh, non-abelian uh of B the coefficients in automorphisms of F is the set of functors. up to the naturally defined equivalence relation of two such functors. Uh, so we obviously can uh, twist uh, the functor by equivalence in the base and by an equivalence in automorphisms and get another factor which is equivalent to the first one. So up to such equivalence, the set denoted by HB out F is a non-abelian uh, cohomology of pivot coefficients in out f. Okay, so uh, now uh, k invariant is just a class in this. Uh, Sorry, I think I should write it here. So that's the meaning of k invariants. They're just classes of, uh, well, uh, this is not a, exactly a key, well, uh, this is the meaning of this invariance of vibrations. So we have an element uh, in this, uh, cohomology thing, uh, which classifies the specific vibration uh, via this map from B to out F, uh, which gives us the vibration. Okay. So now uh, we may classify, uh, so now uh, the layer cakes or spaces 
are classified by collection of uh, homotopy groups and collection of k invariants, uh, which just belong to h e g minus one out of j. So if j is a fiber, but we actually know what this is. This is just uh, an erlenberg maclean space. That looks like this. Okay, uh, so let's quickly review what we did here. Uh, so assume that we have a vibration That means that uh, for some P in the base space, uh, we have, uh, sorry, for some star in the base space, we have uh, the fiber or this uh, point being uh, the homotopy fiber of this map. Uh, if B is connected, we can assume that it is connected because otherwise we just have to deal with separate connected components. Uh, if B is connected, uh, then F lower star, which is just this fiber, uh, does not depend up to homotopy, of course, on the choice of this point star. Now, uh, we may classify uh, such bundles, such vibrations, uh, classify vibrations of the form F. Okay, uh, so a more um, sophisticated way to say it is that we actually have uh, an N plus one uh, so. Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so if F is an N group for it, uh, we have uh, this uh, home object inside of N plus one category of. Uh, N plus two category of N plus one group points. And this thing here is an N plus one category. Uh, is equivalent to the category of uh, such one. So that's a very, uh, highbrow way to say the same sort of thing that I just said, that we classify bundles by K invariants, which are just maps from B to out of F. So we want to classify an end uh, an group point. by squashing it down 
and plus two times until we get a point. Uh, so how 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 we do it? Well, once again, I drew this diagram. Uh, so E is equal to E M. Uh, this is just a point. And so uh, this passage from, for example, E M to E N minus one actually uh, on the categorical level can be described like this. Uh, each J isomorphism, since we have groupoids, all morphisms are isomorphisms, becomes a strict equality. So uh, dropping information is actually dropping information about how we have equivalences between objects, between morphisms. So uh, that's actually the another meaning of this uh, sequence of uh, groupoids or categories, or if we want to call them spaces, uh, that doesn't matter. So uh, now I will try to do an example which illustrates that this approach is somehow reasonable. It works, at least in low dimensional cases. So, Uh, so this is basically a synth theorem on classification of two groups. So there is uh, this result somewhat from group theory, which explains how to classify all two groups. And it has a certain cohomological invariant which describes them. We will now see how to get it. First, I will explain it in purely group theoretic terms. And then later, I will actually explain how it is related to this Posnik of business we will, we've been doing for some time. OK. So Once again, we restrict ourselves to, ourselves to the connected case, but it doesn't really matter uh, because otherwise we'll just have to do the work n times uh, instead of one time. Classified, connected, two group words. Mm. So by uh, contracting the level zero, we get uh, we want to classify, so this is equivalent, uh, two groups, which are just uh, two group points with just one zero object. First, how we will do it? So we take uh, E1 of E, which is G. This is a group of one loops. And we take uh, E2 of E, which is A. Uh, and this is a group of two morphisms. So those are just uh, Self equivalences of the identity morphism. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we add, not, not finally, but uh, additionally, we add an action of a G on A. So, how it is described? Well, uh, first of all, we have two copies of the identity morphism and we want to get a transformation between them. 
which will be denoted rho g of a. And so it is equal to the following thing. Uh, so here we have uh, g, j minus one, uh, and here we have a. So this is how we get uh, to morphism, which is, well, that's basically just conjugation by an element of uh, the group G. And so uh, it coincides with the usual action of P1 on Pi2, Pi1 uh, on Pi2. Another thing we want to get is an associator, which says that uh, multiplication should be associative up to, uh, at least up to, Equivalence. So an associator is just a thing that uh, does this. Uh, and it gives us a map from the third power of the group G to the group A. Uh, how this map works? Well, we basically construct a natural transformation of identity that looks like this. So we have a morphism uh, G1, G2, G3 minus one uh, to the power minus one. Uh, here we have G1, G2, G3. And here we also have uh, G1, G2, G3, and between them we have an associator, which is just this natural transformation described here. Okay, so also alpha should satisfy um, the pentagonal identity. Identity, uh, which looks like this. So, we take four elements, G1, G2, G3, G4, G1, G2, G3, G4, G3. And we go like this. So we have maps uh, that do the following thing. And so this is the pentagonal identity, which can be actually written down in additive form since the group A is a billion, which I will show in a moment. So in the additive form, it looks like this. RG0 acting on alpha of G1, G2, G3. So I'm sorry, I, I just shifted, shifted indices a bit. Uh, instead of one, two, three, four, we will have zero, one, two, three. Um, or uh, yeah, minus G, G0, G1, G2, G3, plus alpha of G0, G1, G2, G3, minus alpha of G0, G1, G2, G3, plus alpha of G0, G1, G2 equal to zero. So that's basically the pentagonal identity. You can see that it is just the difference of uh, uh, two ways we can go by this uh, pentagon. Uh, but also it is a condition that uh, D alpha is zero since alpha is actually uh, a three, co uh, a three co chain on the group G. 
So it makes sense to require that group cohomology differential is equal to zero, and that's precisely it. And so uh, all this uh, talk leads to the following theorem due to sin. Objective uh, correspondence, but P A row alpha, where alpha is an element of uh, this cohomology group. So rho uh, is a representation of G and A. Uh, and alpha is just a class in cohomology of such uh, G module. Okay. So uh, now I think, um, yeah. I suggest we take a break for five minutes and then uh, we will continue and I will show that in fact A is an abelian group. Okay, so let's continue. So now I will just give a bit of algebra, something called Ackman Hilton argument. 
So it's a nice result, a nice and simple result from algebra, which allows us to show that, uh, for example, P2 of a group poet is an abelian group. Uh, if we're not, uh, of course, we can do it topologically by, you know, moving squares around. But uh, actually, we can do it purely categorically. So we may define uh, P2 purely categorically. And we want to understand why this group of two morphisms is actually abelian without appealing to any topological uh, justifications. And so this is afforded by the following uh, lemma. So let X be a set with two operations denoted by star and tensor product mm. such that first uh, dot and uh, tensor product uh, unit second uh, We have the following identity. Then they coincide and are commutative and associative. Okay, so let's prove this statement. First, let us show that units of those two operations coincide. This is a relatively, well, uh, the whole proof is relatively straightforward, but so by uh, one not and one times the product, I denote, uh, um, yes, uh, I denote uh, units of the respective operations. So we have proven that they have the same unit. And now uh, we want to show that uh, the operation can, is computed. Uh, sorry, that, uh, yeah. So we want to show both that operation is computative and that uh, it coincides with uh, tensor product. Of course, uh, I'm sorry if it confuses someone. I, there is no tensor product here. It's just my uh, name for this. Uh, um, for this object. So uh, if you want to old times, you know what? Yeah. So uh, we have uh, a B, which is equal to the following thing. So now I drop, I drop this difference between two possible units since they are the same in fact. So we have B tensor A, and we have B. And that. S B M Z. 
So we've proven that, uh, first of all, uh, A times B is a commutative operation. And also we've proven that it coincides with B O times A. Now we want to show associativity, associativity, associ yes, associ yes, associativity. Uh, so, Uh, we do this by uh, performing the following simple trick. We add unit and then um, write it like this. So this works for an arbitrary uh, unit of commutative operation. Uh, So we've proven this uh, lemma. Now let me show quickly that, first of all, for ordinary homotopy groups, uh, it implies that um, uh, is abelian for n greater or equal to two. Uh, we have two operations, so we can take a sphere and we can contract it along uh, the horizontal. Well, actually, we have uh, a lot of operations on two sphere, like uh, the circle we have uh, through each point uh, an infinitely many uh, different uh, equatorial circles. So we have an operation which contracts uh, a horizontal uh, circle and get this or we can contract mm, a vertical circle and we will get this so. now it is straightforward uh, to see that if we contract once more uh, then we in fact get uh, four uh, a wedge of four uh, equal spheres. So uh, those two operations on which gives a, give us multiplication in homotopy groups, in fact, coincide. So this map, uh, this map gives us multiplication of homotopy groups. The fact that we have uh, such, uh, such, uh, well, such contraction. And so we have at least two operations on homotopy groups and therefore higher homotopy groups are repeated. And the same works in category theory because actually if we consider, for example, P2, uh, of C, where C is the least two category. Then, on two morphisms, we have uh, uh, horizontal composition. Uh, so we have uh, horizontal composition and, uh, or uh, sorry, horizontal composition or bistering. And bistering and vertical composition uh, or just, well, the most basic form of composition, you put one morphism on top of another and you compose them. And so these two give us two different operations on the set of two uh, isomorphisms. And this endows uh, uh, this group with the structure of an abelian group. So that's basically Edmund Hilton argument. And it shows that uh, we in fact have an abelian group A as P2 uh, of, so I defined A as being P2 in a categorical sense of uh, this two group white E. 
Uh, and we've just shown that it is in fact an abelian group. So uh, uh, my notation for cohomology with coefficients uh, in G module A is completely justified. We in fact have an abelian group and so this notation is also justified. Okay. So uh, now, uh, after Edmund Hilton argument, we can try to see how this is related to the general question of business we've been doing. Okay. You may consider a post tower, which looks like this. So this is uh, just one group, just regular group, e is equal to E2, this is E1. Uh, So B uh, is just a group. Mm. Two group F has a form. F is a fiber of this vibration. So F has a form of to category with one object one morphism and some abelian group of two morphisms Uh, thus, uh, so um, morphisms. So uh, this abelian group can be denoted by A. Uh, this group can be denoted by G. And so uh, restoring A, uh, restoring E, is the same as understanding how E is built. G and A. So we want to understand basically why a uh, map K from B to this uh, automorphism three group of the fiber is the same as the cohomology class inside of third cohomology group of G with coefficients in A. That's our goal. Let's take, uh, I'm sorry, let's consider B as a space. As a space, a group can be realized as it's erlenberg back Matlain space. Uh, G1. And we construct it like this. So we take uh, zero simplex. We take one simplex for each element G and G. We take two simplex for each uh, composition. So we have G1, G2, uh, G1, G2. And so we have a tetrahedron for each uh, composition of three elements. So that's an associativity condition. Okay. 
the same in the same way we can do uh, a geometric description of the space f Uh, so it has the form uh, of alien Bergman plane space, but uh, with shifted degree. Uh, and we can describe its uh, simplicial structure. So we have uh, one zero simplex, one uh, one simplex. We have uh, elements. Uh, we have triangles labeled by elements of. A and we have uh, tetrahedra for uh, equations of this form. So uh, we have exactly four faces of tetrahedra, and so uh, like this face and this face are a one and a two and the uh, uh, back faces are A3 and A4. Uh, now we can describe the space, uh, the delupin of this uh, automorphism group. And so, uh, as I simply show, said, as the form F uh, so uh, just for just regular automorphisms of F just just, just uh, without without any funny business just just uh, salt of the land automorphisms. Uh, and also we have uh, triangles for uh, each uh, equation of the, uh, each quality of this form. Um, and we have uh, Tetrahedra labeled by elements of A. Uh, with commuting faces. So faces. Faces commute. Mm, so the classifying map. I'm not saying that this OS description is trivial, but uh, you'll have to believe me. But you, you can, as an exercise, you can think about it. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not quite trivial that we get exactly that, but uh, it's uh, somewhat understandable since f is just since this zero cell is just f itself on which we act. The fact that this uh, just automorphisms form edges is also. Uh, quite clear the fact that we should have such triangles is also clear since we have uh, associativity uh, and uh, so, sorry since that's just uh, the basic the basic group condition uh, and uh, this thing here is also sh also should be satisfied uh, since uh, if we act on an element of a, then we should get the same thing, no matter the order of operations. Okay, uh, so the classifying uh, map is a weak refunctor K from B to 
this thing here, or equivalently, we can just uh, take the classifying space of everything here and we get the functor from kg1 to this space here. Uh, so, uh, simply, surely, looks like this. So it is trivial in dimension zero, no interesting zero simplices. Uh, so in dimension one, we get exactly this uh, representation. We wanted maps from G to automorphisms of A, uh, a map from G to automorphisms of A. Uh, in dimension two, uh, we have self or rather simplices that imply uh, that Roy is a group homomorphism. So they correspond to identities like this. Uh, this is how they're mapped. So we had uh, two simplex here, and it is mapped to a two simplex here, which corresponds to this uh, exact quality. Okay. Uh, in dimension, We have a map to trahedra e g one or just uh, g to the power uh, g cube uh, to elements of a. So elements of a were labeled by uh, this tetrahedra with commuting uh, with commuting faces. And so uh, in dimension three, we get exactly this alpha, which we were desiring to get, this uh, th three, uh, three cold chain on the group G. And so in dimension four, Uh, leaves uh, the pentagonal identity. The alpha is equal to zero. And so schematically, it all looks like this. Okay, uh, so I think that we're almost done for today. Uh, I want just to uh, finalize with the moral of the story. So yeah, uh, first of all, we indeed established the fact that it is the same thing. Uh, this description of Iasinth theorem, where we have this fourth uh, G, A, Rho, and Alpha, and this description where Posnikov towers, where they, we have this K invariant. Uh, but uh, the moral of the story for groups is that, in fact, we have uh, an interpretation of 
hn of uh, g with coefficients in a uh, it just classifies uh, classifies uh, group words with fiber k, k a n minus one over k g one. Mm, and so uh, if n is equal to two, those are just group extensions. So uh, that was uh, two morals of the story. So first of all, uh, Poisnikov towers indeed uh, give us a way to classify uh, certain uh, well, certain groupoids, so we classify two groupoids via posting of towers. And another um, moral of the story is that, in fact, uh, group cohomology has a very clear interpretation in terms of classifying extensions, but not uh, necessarily of groups, but of groupoids. So that's, I think, of higher group words. That's, I think, uh, all that I wanted to say today. Uh, thank you for coming, and I hope I see you in two days. Thank you.